Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you today. Um, how are y'all doing today? <sighs> yeah, it's hot in here, huh? And whenever I talk, you know, the temperature always goes about 15 degrees. We've measured that, actually. So we'll do our best today. We are continuing our series in the book of Acts of the Apostles. And we are coming to the end of a very, very important kind of pivotal story in that whole book, which is the story of where... Through the Apostle Peter, the gospel breaks out of the Jewish world, which it has almost exclusively been in up to this point in chapter 10, and goes into the most unlikely, unimaginable place in the non-Jewish world, or the Gentile world. And that is to a man named Cornelius, who is in the army that as is currently, the Roman army, um, currently occupying and therefore oppressing the people of Israel. And he is not just a foot soldier, he's actually a leader, a commander of sorts over a special forces type of group called the Italian Regiment. So we talked all about that. Um, Wayne talked about their encounter last week when they finally uh, meet each other at Cornelius' house in Caesarea, which is 30 miles up uh, from where modern Tel Aviv would be, if that gives you kind of a reference. So... What we're going to get to today and in this chapter is that Peter is now, because he's been summoned and God has told him to go, uh, is now going to say, this is the gospel. Here it is. This is what is involved. And what we're going to see is that the theme, uh, because we so often shrink down the gospel to be something that it's not, or just a little bit of what it really is. The theme is, in the gospel, Jesus is Lord. That's the theme. That's the theme. We, that, you might not see that in the four spiritual laws or something like that. But the true theme of the gospel is that Jesus is Lord. And therefore, what that means is because of what he has done through the cross... ...and what God's plan was all along... ...Jesus has now been elevated to the status of being in charge of all creation... ...and is therefore pushing away everything that is the enemy... ...of God and of his most prized part of creation, humanity. But really all of creation. And so what we're going to see in this is that Jesus being Lord... ...is the force of what uh, uh, Peter is going to tell Cornelius about... ...and not really invite him into. He's not going to lay down some spiritual laws or say, you know, God loves you... ...and has a wonderful plan for your life... And so, you know, he's not going to focus it at all. In fact, watch how he gives the gospel. He basically starts off with saying, this is for Israel. Not for non-Israel. This really isn't for you. But you know all about this because Cornelius and members of his household were what were known as God-fearers. Meaning they followed the ways of the Jews short of, for the men, circumcision. ...but he would give money to help the Jewish people. Now remember, he's a leader of a special forces group of the Roman army... ...who has come in to keep the peace in the province, the Roman province of Judea... ...in which Jerusalem sits as the capital. They would have said Caesarea is the capital. But the Jew would have said, no, Jerusalem is the capital. Meaning, it was Cornelius' job if some Jewish faction got out of line... ...to take his soldiers in, arrest them, kill them if they got too far out of the way. And then those who would be accused of treason or of insurrection... ...trying to start a riot, to have them crucified. That was his job. And that's the person God picks... ...to bring the gospel to out of the Jewish world into the Gentile or 
non-Jewish world. So up on the screen, let's dive right into the story. Peter's come into his house. He says, what did you want? And he, Cornelius tells him all about the dream. Wayne covered that last week. So he hears what's going on. He says, well, now I see that God's you know, perspective is a little larger than just the Jewish people. Now, he begins to give him the gospel. And notice how much information Peter thinks Cornelius already has. Just by being where he is, living where he is, and having sort of converted over to Judaism. Up on the screen, Peter talking to Cornelius and a house full of people. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel. See, that's where it started. That's where Peter thinks it will stay. He can't see it transcending that, you know, eternal boundary and going any further. That's where he starts. Telling the good news, that's the word gospel, where we get our word gospel, the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Now, that's the gospel in a nutshell. That's, that's in essence, what he's going to build on. Now, he takes his next step. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, that's to the north, after the baptism that John preached. Now, he's referencing John the Baptist. In other words, once he was preaching, you know everything that was going on there, and then you know what broke loose after that. Now, he continues and puts words to what it is that he knows about that has happened. Here it is, verse 38. How God anointed... Now he's drawing out of the idea of the servant songs of Isaiah, out of the prophets, that God would anoint a special person and that person would lead God's victory in the kingdom of God, that he would accomplish all that God wanted. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth in Galilee, with the Holy Spirit and power. Now look at this. And how he went around doing good... ...and healing all who were under the power of the devil... ...because God was with him. That's warfare reference. Just lock that one in for a minute. We are witnesses of everything he did... ...in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. Now stop right there. See, he's just simply laying out. He starts with, you know what God promised. Well, of course he knew he'd converted to Judaism. He knew what the prophets taught. He knew that God was bringing a kingdom to his creation that would override the demonic kingdom where people would find themselves with blessing. God's kingdom, in a word, blessing. Satanic kingdom, suffering. And he knew that God was doing that because that's what the prophets had, had taught and what he had learned by being a convert to Judaism. But he also knew about Jesus because that stuff wasn't hidden under a rock. He had heard about him. He'd maybe even seen him. He'd obviously been in the army long enough to be elevated to the role of centurion. Who knows how long he'd been in that region. But he knew about Jesus. And he knew, at the very least, the stories that there was a man that some people said is the Messiah the Jews are waiting for, who then was turned over by the Jewish leadership and whom the Romans crucified. He knows that much. And then Peter says, and you should know the reason God would have summoned me to tell you this stuff, the reason he told you to sin for me is because I'm one of the people he wanted to be a witness of all this stuff. I was with Jesus from the very beginning that he started all of this. And you know that they crucified him. Now the next verse goes on, verse 40. But God, no, notice they crucified him, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. It just wasn't hidden. It, this happened. He was not seen by all the people. Although Paul later will tell us he was seen by over 500 at one time. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen. By us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. We saw him live. We saw him do miracles. We saw him be crucified. And then three days later, we saw him walking, talking, and even eating with us. We saw it all. And when he called us all those years ago, we had no idea that he was preparing us to be able to be witnesses to the people of what we were going to see. We don't go in trying to convince anybody of anything. We don't go in with a lot of principles or policies or rituals or rules to follow. We just go in and say that one we've been waiting for has come and we saw it. We saw it happen. That's what they are as witnesses. Now, 
He goes on to talk a little bit more about that up on the screen, verse 42. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Now look at this. All the prophets testify about him. That everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. See, So he says, you know what God promised in the prophets. You know about Jesus, what he did in his life. You know that he was crucified by your government, by the Roman government being turned over by our leaders. You know that three days later the rumor was that he was around and people actually said that they saw him, that he had been raised from the dead, which for us as Jews and for Cornelius as a convert would have been saying, you know that means God's kingdom is now here and starting to work in power. And eventually we'll take over everything. You know that's what's going on. That's the sign of the beginning of the kingdom of God. Two things, resurrection and the Holy Spirit. That's what the prophets say. That's what the new covenant teaches. So I'm just trying to imagine Cornelius's head spinning. As Peter is just laying all of this out. Now, I think, you can't prove this, but I think in Peter's mind, he thought, I'll go in, I'll kind of, you know, make myself ceremonially unclean as a, as a good kosher Jew. I'll tell him the story because God told me to get here and then I'm out. I'll go through a seven-day purification ritual or whatever's required and then I'll get back to business with taking the good news to the Jewish people. I'm sure that probably was what was in his mind. I don't think he had any idea as he's kind of wrapping it up saying, well, Cornelius, you know that all of the prophets said that this one was coming and that true forgiveness, meaning all that stuff that blocks us from God will be washed away at one time and that now we will have access to God, perfect access to God. I don't think he has any idea what is about to happen. And this is how the story ends up on the screen. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Now look what happens. The circumcised believers, think the Jewish believers, those who went up from Joppa or Tel Aviv to Caesarea with Peter. They accompanied Peter. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished. ...that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. The word is a fascinating word in the Greek language. It means to be beside yourself. We might say, I was absolutely blown away, but not in a good way, in a bad way. It blew me, I couldn't believe the guy did that, it blew me away. Couldn't believe our government made that decision, that just blew me away. It doesn't mean... This is wonderful, it means I can't believe it. I'm, I'm standing next to myself, watching myself engage in all of this. I'm beside myself. This is insanity. They can't believe what's going on because they know the Spirit means God has now accepted these people. And how could he accept the very enemies of Israel? How could he do it? Put it in our context. Now, I'm just going to go way out there, okay? Let's say ISIS somehow gets control of all of the Western world. The way world events are, sometimes you go, who knows? There's no guarantees on anything except God's love and eternal life. So let's just say that happens. What if that happened and suddenly it was ISIS that God began to bring the love of Christ to because he loved those men, those women, and wanted to draw them to himself so they weren't washed away when his kingdom comes in full power and washes away everything satanic, everything sinful, everything broken. We look at that and go, well, but he won't because he doesn't like those guys. And we don't like them very much either. They're wicked, they're evil, Every step they take is to dominate or destroy human life. 
They don't hold anything sacred except their own ideology. A little child has no more value to them than anybody else, and they'll gladly destroy that child. If it's a female child, sometimes it's worse than just being destroyed. We look on them with disgust, with hate, with anger, and sometimes we say, why aren't the nations doing more to stop what's going on? You know, thousands and thousands of people trying to flee the Middle East. And we're going, well, how do we accommodate all these people? But nobody seems to be thinking, how do we go back in and give them their country back? All of this going on. We don't like these folks. But the Bible says that when Jesus died on the cross, it was for the whole world. And they're part of the world. For God so loved the world that Jesus came, that Jesus died. That Jesus opened the door. Now that might seem far-fetched to you, the whole ISIS thing. But you have to understand that's why these Jewish believers are astonished. Because the very enemies of God, the worst people around, the Romans, and not just any hoi polloi Roman, a leader of their armies that probably has Jewish blood on his hands, is the person God's bringing into his kingdom? How can God's love transcend that? Sure, God loves us. Look at us. You know what I'm saying? We're wonderful. That's their thinking. Unfortunately, sometimes that's our thinking too, huh? How could God jump over such an unbelievable geopolitical issue as Rome holding hostage all of Judea? And even Jerusalem, the place where the temple sits. Not many years after this happens, Rome will go in and level that temple and kill tens of thousands of Jews. It's hot with hostility. It's anger everywhere you look. There are thousands of Jews that are rising up and becoming guerrilla forces, trying to kill Romans as much as they can. Judas is from their ranks. They will eventually be wiped out by Rome. It's not a cute little Sunday school story. Do you guys hear what I'm saying to you? It is all out hate and war. And so when Peter goes in, only because God tells him to, and he begins to lay out the gospel, this is what God said to the Jews, you're probably going to be left out. But I'm doing this because God said. And suddenly, all of these other kosher Jewish believers in Jesus see the Spirit come on these guys, and they're experiencing the very gift, the very promise that God gave to Israel so back ago through Joel and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, all those wonderful prophets. They're experiencing that too. Astonished is putting it mildly. And if we get anything out of that word astonished, out of this whole story, we ought to get that there's not one man, woman, or child on this earth that God does not desire for himself. Not one. And it doesn't matter my opinion of them or your opinion of them or our country's opinion of them or how their theology is different or what kind of nonsense they're involved in. The love of God transcends all of that and hopes beyond hope that that man, that woman, will turn from what they're doing and trust Jesus for salvation. And right now, even now, the gospel of Jesus, through the most unimaginable means, is working its way through the Middle East. Thousands are leaving, that's true, but the gospel's not overcome. The gospel's not limited or locked in. And the Lord, in his own way, is speaking to the most unlikely people. I have heard, and maybe you have heard, stories even of very strict Muslim clerics having dreams about Jesus, who is in the Quran, considered a prophet. Not as high as Muhammad, but he's a prophet. And they're trying to figure out what is going on here. I can tell you what's going on. Jesus is knocking on the door. That's what's going on. 
That's the gospel. That's how God works. And this is a great picture in chapter 10 of how this all unfolds. Now, there's a little bit more in the story if you want to look up on the screen. The Jewish believers are shocked, to put it mildly. They can't understand what's going on, but they know. Verse 46, they heard them, that's Cornelius, the Gentiles, speaking in tongues and praising God, just like they did at Pentecost, right? It's exactly, looks exactly the same. Then Peter said, can anyone keep these people from being baptized? Meaning, and they would have understood it very clearly, welcomed into the family of God, acknowledged as members of good standing in God's eternal kingdom. Can anyone keep them from saying that God welcomes them in and that he sees them as much as he sees any of us as members or citizens of good standing in his kingdom? Can anybody keep them from doing that? We just saw what happened. Can anybody say no to them about that? Because that's what Jesus said to do when he comes into someone's life. Can anyone say no to that? They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he, Peter, ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, whenever you hear Christ, always insert Messiah. Because that's what's going on. The prophesied Messiah. In the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. And that ends chapter 10. That ends the story. Now, chapter 11 is going to be, as you might guess, Peter defending himself... Because word gets back very quickly to the Christian leadership in Jerusalem that one of their apostles has broken with tradition, I mean radically broken, and gone into the home of none other than a Roman army officer, for heaven's sakes, and that the, the Spirit of God seemed to have fallen on them. It's going to be mayhem for a little while. And so Peter's going to spend a lot of chapter 11 just saying, look, this is what happened. What could I do? I saw it. The guys with me saw it. What were we supposed to do? Were we supposed to say, we don't care what God's doing in your life? You're not welcome? What could we do? That'll be chapter 11. Now, I want to give you three things very, very quickly. You can jot these down. The story speaks so much for itself, but I do just want to pull out three things that God is promising to everyone. He's promising to the Jews first. He promised to those Romans next. <laughs> he promises to everyone. He has for everyone who comes to Jesus Christ. The things that Peter told Cornelius about are the things that are true for you and me as well. You can write these down if you want to. I'm going to go kind of quick through them. The first thing is the big thing that he promises, and that is peace with God. Peace with God. Now, that has often been interpreted to mean that God is just so angry with you. He's just furious because of how you've lived. And that after Jesus died on the cross and paid the price for sin, which he did, and you accepted Jesus, that God was like, well, all right, I guess it's all right now. That's how that is almost always interpreted. That's not true, however. Peace with God doesn't mean God is no longer mad at me. Peace with God means I now am no longer anti-God. That's what it means. Because sin in my life had so perverted and contorted my thinking. That hamartia that the New Testament talks about, that Paul spends so much time in the book of Romans talking about, just pushed me further and further and further away from my creator. And stood like a barrier between God and me. And so when Christ died on the cross, what he comes to bring, a war-torn world, and not just politically war-torn, a spiritual war-torn world is peace. The kingdom of God looks like peace. Look what Paul says up on the screen. Romans 5, he says, Therefore, since we've been justified, think uh, there's no more condemnation now, as the way he'd say in chapter 8, you're right with God, in a right standing with God. We've been justified through faith, simply believing we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So you can sort of understand peace or define peace in this way. Peace is, in effect, being restored to friendship with God. Friendship with God. Remember, it is that God so loved the world that Jesus 
I'm, just, I'm afraid that when we view God as furious with everybody, we attribute more to God what the scripture describes as Satan being like. When we understand God as being perfect love, which is how John defines him, but that sin stood in the way, then we begin to understand the gospel a little bit more. And that God's whole plan is to bring his kingdom in. When Jesus said, this is how you pray, after he said, first we honor you, our Father in heaven, then he said, then you pray, your kingdom, that's God's kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which looks like love, joy, peace. It's friendship with God. Let me give you the second one. The second one is this. He mentions this. I wish I had time to explain this in more detail, but I just don't. That is healing from Satan's influence. The second thing that he has for us is healing from Satan's influence. When Jesus walked on the earth, he would heal people. He would cast out demons. And every time he did that, it was, in effect, an act of war against all of the, the influence that Satan has over the earth. Jesus, in fact, called Satan the prince of the earth. And John would later say, we know that Satan, this is in 1 John, we know that the devil controls the whole world. It was a hostile takeover. You can read all about it in Genesis chapter 3. And so when the kingdom of God comes, it pushes back everything. So every time Jesus healed someone, it was a victory for God and his kingdom. Whenever he cast out a demon, it was a victory for God and his kingdom. And the ultimate victory, the ultimate healing from satanic influence, from this devastating influence, is that sin is done away with once and for all. And therefore, death is dealt with decisively. Let me show you a couple of passages. We'll go to John, 1 John. He says, he who does what is sinful is of the devil. Why is that? Because of that devastating influence Satan wields over people. He appeals to that fallen, sinful side in mankind. The devil has been sinning from the beginning. Now look what he says. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Have you ever heard it that way? What he came to do was to overturn a usurper and take back creation, including humanity. But unlike, unlike the trees or the rocks or the waterfalls or the flowers, humanity makes a choice. Humanity gets to decide if they want to be redeemed back. The reason he came was to destroy the devil's work. Now, let me show you one out of Isaiah. I like this a lot. The New, Testament's, uh, New Testament will reference this passage in a lot of different occasions. But up on the screen is Isaiah speaking, and he says, How beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those who bring good news. Now, look at the four phrases. They're all basically the same thing, but they're going to combine to make something bigger. Brings good news, who proclaim peace. See, those two go hand in hand. Who, uh, who bring good tidings, like good news. Who proclaim salvation. See, we're saved from something. Who say to Zion, your God reigns? What has that got to do with salvation? When you understand the gospel, it has everything to do with salvation. Because when God takes over, what he brings is peace and joy and love and salvation. That is the good news. And that peace and love and joy we get to partake of now. And that's the, that's the third thing I want to give you. The third thing that God has for everyone who turns to Jesus is just simply God's very presence with them. God never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He's always with us. When the Spirit came on Cornelius and all of the people sitting there, God had now taken up his home in those people. Now you stop and you think about these things. And it's kind of mind-boggling. Unfortunately, I'm afraid we hear this stuff so much that we forget that God has really brought us into his throne room, as it were, into his living room, into his home, and that we now have perfect peace. The guilt and the shame and all that other stuff, trying to live up to his expectations as we imagine them, or some pastor told us they're there, we read in a discipleship book or whatever, just doesn't exist. It is now living with the Father and allowing his presence in me to transform me as I trust him more and more and more and more. Paul would finally sum it up by simply saying, circumcision, uncircumcision, that doesn't matter. See, all the, the tend to things we think of, the religious stuff, you know, what I need to do to please God and so forth, all of that doesn't matter. Then he says, what does matter is faith 
You say, I'm trusting God. Expressing itself through love. That's what matters. Faith. Expressing itself through love. I am telling you what, you guys. If the church could grab hold of that one verse. If the church in America could grab hold of that one verse. What really matters is faith. And that faith in trusting God is going to work its way out in how we treat people around us, how we show love, how we share, how we give, how we sacrifice, how we care. That one verse, I'm convinced, would transform the United States of America. We can start a lot of programs, we can plant a lot of churches, all of that stuff has its place. But until we really grab hold that it is about faith in what Jesus has done and trusting him moment by moment by moment. And as we do, being transformed to be like him so that my life becomes more and more loving. That makes all the difference. I'm going to close with this verse. I'm going to pray. Jesus said this the night that he was betrayed. He'd be crucified the next morning up on the screen. He's talking with his 12 and he says this. All who love me will do what I say. Meaning what? Meaning that if I really have love for God, I'm going to want to follow. This is not do what I say or I won't love you. That's a human thing. That's a human kind of deal. Do what I want or you, I won't show you my approval. Right? That's a human thing. What he's saying is when that love inside of you is truly Evoked when it really begins to fire up, that passion really begins to grow, which is a work of the Holy Spirit as I respond. When that starts happening, you will do what I say. You'll want to follow me. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow. You'll want to follow me. Now, look what he says after that. When that happens, my Father will love them. He'll love you. His love will be on you. You'll begin to experience his love in profound new ways. And we, that's the Father and the Son, will come and make our home with each of them or each of you. God is with you right now if you have given your life to Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we bless you for just the profound truth of the gospel. We bless you for how right now it is changing lives worldwide. We bless you, Lord, for how men, women, and children are hearing the news, are sensing your love, are responding to the invitation you give them to friendship with you, to come in and to have sin washed completely away, and to begin to encounter your peace and your joy and your love. And Father, I would just pray that if there is anyone here today who has never taken that first step of faith, putting faith in Jesus for salvation, that you would just encourage that person this morning to trust you, to take that step, to receive Christ as Savior and as Lord and to be born of your Spirit. And Father, I pray for us as a church family and just as individuals, Lord, as we live our lives day by day, I pray that we too would grab hold of the whole idea of faith and how as we walk with you, love works its way out. But mostly, Lord, just that today we would rest in the truth that you are with us because you love us, that you've made a way for us through Jesus, through the cross, and that we can have the great blessing that you have all along desired to pour on humanity. The prophets talked about it millennia ago, and now it's come through Jesus. Help us to grab hold and to walk in faith, Lord. And we just thank you for this morning. We praise that we could be together. We praise you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We give you blessing and honor and praise today. And we pray it in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Everyone said amen. God bless you guys. If you have kids, pick them up at the fellowship hall. I'll be down here if you want to talk or pray. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Amen.